people kind of trickle in. So welcome everyone to our second session. The session you're in right now is things we've discovered about teaching pedagogy while being students. Um, and I will let each of the presenters introduce themselves and get rolling whenever you're ready. So we're so happy to be here. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Samantha. So I am Marianne Schneider and I am going to get the shared screen thing going on. Okay, so hopefully, are you seeing that? Can you see my PowerPoint? Okay, and then I just moved it so you might not be able to. Um, okay, did you see it advance? The slide? Nope, it's we're still on that front screen. Okay. The presentation mode, Marianne. Yeah, I just hold, sorry, two seconds. You might be sharing the wrong. Mm -hmm. And while you're doing that, I'll just mention, I'll give you kind of jazzy fingers when we've got 10 minutes left and then, and then just a five, so. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, now are you seeing the screen with our faces? Okay, excellent. So I'm Marianne. There I am on the left. And we have Marlene and Stacy. And I'm not going to go through each of our bios. They're in the Mighty Networks uh, platform there. Um, just so you know, we all teach in the NDFS, so nutrition, dietetics, and food uh, science. Oh, I know what department I'm in. And <laughs> food science department. And yeah, it's great. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is first off some background, and then we'll go through a little bit of some theories and some research and then examples and resources. It's great, we're gonna have fun. So first off, um, what to expect. We got together for this presentation because all of us are students and have been learning about teaching and we wanted to share what we've learned about teaching. So I am in the process of getting a master's of education degree in curriculum and instruction and I love it. I love it. And I've learned so much. And I also am in my last semester starting in fall. So yay. And then Marlene and Stacy just completed the AQ course. So it's a 25 week course uh, focused on effective online teaching practices. So really cool. And they'll be sharing some great tips with you. So that's us. That's how we are students. And um, we're also instructors and teachers. So we will discuss for me, I'll start off with some theory, some background as I was going through my through my coursework, as I learned about the theories it really helped inform me as to why we're doing what we're doing and um, you know why we might need to do some extra some extra work sometimes. So um, I'll be talking about learning theories and then Marlene will be talking about active learning and then Stacy will be talking about building an inclusive learning community. Okay, so the, the learning theories class that I took was in fall 2020. And like I said, it really helped me understand the why behind the different teaching strategies and also to see kind of how we've gotten to where we are now. I recognize that this is a super intense slide, so I won't go through every single word, but knowing the background and the process of how we have gotten to where we are really helped me understand why we're doing the things that we're doing and why we have done what we've done in the past. So let's start off with the late 1800s. At this point, um, people were asked to like look inside of their heads and describe what they were thinking. So it wasn't very scientific and we're just getting into the scientific process sort of things. So in the early 1900s, we shift to observable behavior and environmental events, and this is known as behaviorism. And this really takes hold as far as education goes. So behaviorism would be your traditional lecture, that would be the stimulus, and the student responds by taking the test. So very traditional, kind of what we, we often think about when you think about schooling, the traditional. 
At the same time in Switzerland and Russia, Piaget and Vygotsky were studying more development and social and cultural influences and how that came into play. But in North America, we were really focused on behaviorism. So we weren't really going for that at all. So by the 1940s, they were researchers were realizing that there was more than just this observable behavior, uh, this stimulus response sort of thing. And so they started to, to look into social learning theory. And then a little bit later, um, they came to realize even more that it's not just behavior, that it's also what's going on in the brain. And so that's where we have cognitivism. And then finally, by late 1900s, we start to incorporate some of these Piaget and Vygotsky principles about social and cultural influences and how that impacts learning and helps learning. So you can see kind of the progression, um, why we are still very, I would say most places are very founded in behaviorism and behavioristic type teaching principles because that was the foundation for so long. And yet we are shifting and finding that there's other things that, that work. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about all of those theories. I'm just going to talk about behaviorism and cognitivism and constructivism um, because I feel like those are some pretty major ones that you might uh, find when you are teaching. So behaviorism, like I said, is kind of that, that classic um, uh, lecture test type teaching style. So the basic idea is that learning requires a behavior change. The teacher role, the teacher imposes the knowledge and point of view. And in for the learner, the student is the object of the learning. So prose, it's very observable and measurable, like super fantastic, because you can say, yes, the student did this check and they did this check. Um, it's very structured, uh, kind of helpful for students who have anxiety and appreciate that structure. And it's really well suited for learning objectives like remembering, understanding and applying. Okay, it works really well for those. Some cons uh, in this case uh, with behaviorism, knowledge is objective. There's one answer and the teacher tells you that answer, which we know isn't really how a lot of life works. And it can decrease intrinsic motivation. Okay, so cognitivism. The basic idea with cognitivism is that learning involves mental representations or associations that aren't necessarily reflected in behavior change. They might be, but they, they don't have to be. So for the teacher, they're guiding the student through the problem solving process. It allows students to use their own mental uh, capacities to find solutions. And the learner, it's more of an active role for the learner. Um, they're creating meaning from informal experiences and formal instruction. So some pros for this one is it highlights people's thought processes and can be combined with other approaches, which that's my favorite thing with this. Cognitivism can be applied to pretty much anything. And um, some cons, it, it dismisses important factors in human behavior and it doesn't allow for direct observation because we can't really see exactly how people are thinking. So cognitivism, if you're wondering like, okay, what does this actually look like? Um, this would be things like mnemonic devices um, or chunking information so that it's small bits, you know, taking, making sure that, that you're not like loading too much um, cognitive load would be part of cognitivism. Okay, and then constructivism. When I learned about constructivism, this was the one that was like, oh my goodness, I found my teaching theory. This was the one that resonated with me a lot. So the main idea with constructivism is that knowledge can't be simply transmitted to the learner, that the learner must construct their own learning and their own understanding. So for the teacher role, it aid, the teacher aids in exploring topics and coming to their own, uh, helping students come to their own understanding by asking questions. And for the learner, they're a very active participant in building their own knowledge. Okay. So some pros of constructivism is it stimulates student self-confidence as they solve problems, it encourages higher level learning, and they're working as a team for the most part, depending on how it's set up. 
So some cons that are very real, I learned this my first semester trying to implement this, is that there can be a lack of structure depending on how you set it up. My students uh, let me know that they were feeling a little bit lost. And so I had to adjust. Um, and it requires extended preparation time for the teacher, which I can attest to that. If you've developed a lab or anything, you know that there's a ton of prep time in the, in the, to get that all set up. So the takeaway from this isn't to say just because I really connected with constructivism doesn't mean that that's like the learning theory. Um, there's pros and cons to all of the learning theories. Um, so think of the different teaching methods like a tool in a tool belt and use the teaching method that best lines up with your objective and go for it. Okay, they're all, there's great things with all of them. So do what works best for your situation. Okay, so that is the end of mine. Marlene, if you want to take on over. Yeah, so I'm sitting next to a window and it's raining. So I hope that that background noise is not coming through. This section is talking about research, but also active learning. And so Marianne, if you go to the next slide, um, this slide just shows kind of an outline of all of the modules in that 25 week AQ course. And there were, kind of, were four areas. And the one that I, well, one that I really appreciated was on promoting active learning. And so I'm gonna kind of focus um, my remarks on that um, content. So if you go to the next slide, then when we talk about active learning, uh, it's, it's okay, we can move up. Um, I think most of us understand what it is. Basically, it's not passive learning. And so passive learning is generally understood to be um, direct lecture and active learning is some sort of strategy or activity to get students more involved and engaged in their own learning process. And so I've listed a few examples here. This is not an exhaustive list, but you can also see on this graphic that um, there's some active learning strategies that are pretty simple, and then it goes to more complex um, strategies. And they all have uh, benefits and they all have a place depending on um, how you want to use them. So for our next slide, um, active learning has kind of become a like buzzword or like a, definitely a, a style of teaching that's got a lot of attention and is highly promoted and, and for good reason because we know that students are more likely to remember content and information if they have an active, um, if they're engaging in it actively. And so uh, this image shows that um, when you compare passive learning to active learning, the percentage of what people remember uh, generally increases. So on the next slide, this is a study. Let's see, click again for the image to come up. There you go. Um, this is a study <clears throat> that the AQ course highlighted, but also a study that I have been familiar with earlier. And so I, I was happy to see it again. But before I tell you about the details and methodology of this study that was done at Harvard, I just want to read this quote by one of the uh, principal investigators. He said, deep learning is hard work. And by deep learning, he, he's including active learning in that. The effort involved in active learning can be misinterpreted by students as a sign of poor learning. On the other hand, a superstar lecturer um, can explain things in such a way as to make students feel like they are learning more than they actually are. And so, um, I want you to keep that in mind as we go through these next few slides because, um, because you may have encountered the same challenge or, or noticed the same thing with your students. You can go to the next slide, Marianne. So here's a few more details about that study. Um, it happened to be a physics course, an undergraduate introductory course. And so what they did is they did traditional lecture style for a while. Then they divided the class in half and they randomly assigned some students to the active learning class and some stayed in the passive or the traditional class and then they switched them again. And at multiple points, they were, they were uh, evaluated and tested with um, an exam on what they remembered and understood. 
you can go to the next one. So here is what, um, uh, here's a couple paragraphs from the results of that survey. It said the authors found that students felt as if they learned more from the lectures, but that in fact scored higher on tests following the active learning sessions. So actual learning and feeling of learning were strongly anti-correlated. Then um, also the authors are quick to point out that this should not be interpreted as suggesting that students dislike active learning. In fact, many students have shown, or many studies have shown that students quickly warm up to the idea once they begin to see the results. But sometimes that takes a discussion or that takes an instructor helping them connect the dots, to understand the why or the intention behind uh, the active learning process and what you're hoping to accomplish. So um, if you'll advance to the next slide, Marianne, at the time that I was taking the AQ course, I was also reading this book by James Lane called Distracted, Why Students Can't Focus and What You Can Do About It. And a lot of the things that he was saying in the chapter that I was reading at the time really matched up with what I was learning in the AQ course. So I just want to share a few things. If you'll click the next button, Marianne, thanks. So we often assume that active learning is the best and that it trumps passive learning. And as Marianne shared, all different types of um, learning and teaching have their place and are relevant at different times. And so uh, this quote from James Ling kind of points that out. He says, it doesn't matter what teaching technique we use, meaning it doesn't matter if it's active learning, passive learning, interactive, or collaborative learning. At some point during the class period, attention will flag. That's, that doesn't have to do with the method of teaching because they can all be done well or poorly. The flagging of attention happens because that's just how attention works. Then this was the key sentence. He says, students need changes of scene shifts in format and opportunities to pause and reflect and catch their cognitive breath. So then if you go to the next slide, Marianne, um, he references a few studies, a couple of studies, and, and then he says, if you spend an entire class period doing polls, demonstrations, and other active learning techniques, you'd see the same cycles of attention turning on and off through, uh, that you'd see with passive learning and lectures. So then, um, then he, mentioned some results from the two studies he references, and he says what, what helped stir up the attention of students in the second study was the shift from passive learning to active learning. And as the first study demonstrated, attention remained high after the transition back to passive learning. What mattered was the change. And so this was really fascinating to me because it was also matching up with um, a pattern that I had been introduced to in the book called Hitting Pause. So if you advance to the next slide, Marianne, then um, in Hitting Pause, uh, the author Gail Rice um, talks about this pattern of breaking up your lecture where you have periods of active learning and then you do some sort of mini lecture in between and then you go back to an active learning activity and um, you kind of have this pattern throughout your class. And it, of course, it doesn't have to look perfect like this. But there just needs to be a mix of different types of learning during a class session. If you go to the next one. Um, so this image reminds me of interval training um, that you may have you know, experienced or seen on a, on a treadmill or another piece of exercise equipment. And so I actually talk a lot more about this in another pre-recorded presentation that's a quad side um, presentation. Uh, that should be available. So um, I won't spend a lot of time on this one right now, but basically the pattern is um, having periods of active learning and then going back to passive and then active is re really helpful in helping students learn and retain information. And it's also really helpful in terms of some physical benefits too when you're training or exercising. So that was interesting to me to see another mind-body connection. Um, and then if you'll go to the next slide, Marianne. So back to that book um, on distracted, James Lang rep recommends a strategy for helping you to build a course session um, that's following this pattern. And so he says, get some note cards. And then uh, if you go to the next slide, Marianne, and then look at active learning strategies that are your favorites or ones that would 
that you want to try out and that would fit well with the content that you're teaching and choose a handful. And then go to the next slide. And then he says, and then on your note cards, make um, like write down your activities that you want to do during the, the class period. And so there's one activity per card. And then also write down um, like the, the passive elements, like the parts that need some lecture or some instru direct instruction and write those down and then kind of map it out and assign a amount of time that the, so that you stay within your allotted um, time limit during the class period. And then he says, you can mix it up. So you can try it one, like a certain pattern one way for one year, and then you can change up uh, the note cards or the strategies throughout the class and see if, you're, if it works better a different way. And so I thought that was kind of fun um, exercise or something to try. And then the last um, slide in my section is talking about uh, how you tap through this to an online setting. And so in, in this, um, well, the challenge with an online audience, especially if they're asynchronous, is, no, is that not all active learning activities transfer directly, or at least they don't all look the same. But once again, the principle is you just mix it up. And so the passive learning parts are mini lectures. So uh, five to 10 minutes or, or so, and then you have some activities in there. And, it's, and ideally, they can, the order of those activities doesn't have to be linear or done in a certain order. Sometimes it does need to be. But then there's just a, there's some variety and a mix of passive and active types of learning. So in summary, the next slide, um, James Ling says, because of our directed, because our directed attention fatigues over time, longer periods demand that our attention must feature regular change and variety. And so if you click the next button, there you go. So in our profession, uh, we love to teach the principles of balance, variety, and moderation and how they apply to nutrition and healthy eating. But I think they also apply to education and other areas of life. And so it's all about using a mix or a blend of different learning strategies uh, together, but also in moderation. And um, I think it, it makes a beautiful uh, result at the end. So that's all for me. Okay, so Marianne, if you stop, I'm going to switch over and share mine now. All right, is everyone seeing the right screen? Advancing? Yes. Okay. All right, so like Marlene mentioned, and Mary Ann, me and Mary Ann, or me and Marlene took an AQ course, which was on effective online instruction or learning. And as part of that course, we had these weekly modules we had to complete and we would watch little video clips and then we would participate in a discussion, review some resources. Uh, but the part I liked the best about that course is that we were required to implement something that we had learned in that module to our um, instruction or our courses in some way that week. And then we had to write a reflection about it. So we were actually required to do something and that's the hard part. We go to these ETE conferences, we get really excited. I'm like, oh, so many ideas to put into my class. And then next week is like the last week before the semester starts. And we're like, oh, no time to do it. I guess I'll save this for next semester. And then we forget about it and we don't do it. So I really love that I had to implement it um, in the moment. And, and a lot of times it really didn't take that much extra time to implement. Um, little small things ended up, um, I feel like, being a big impact in the course. And so that's something to remember that even just something small usually doesn't take that much time to do, but will be a positive impact um, for, you, for your teaching and for your students. So since we've been kind of sitting for a long time now, it's almost 11, I'm gonna give you all a moment to sit and stretch. Um, here's some yoga poses you could do in your desk if you want. Um, and if you get a chance, write down on a piece of paper, or if you're really willing, um, type into the chat box, what um, has been most clear for you at this point in our presentation and how you could apply it to your teaching. And I'll share a few of those if I can want my chat here. Variety, good, thanks for uh, sharing that, Marla. 
Anyone else have something that really stuck out to them? Intervals of different activities. Yeah, I love that idea. Anyone else? Um, okay, and then uh, just got hired for teaching and nursing. She loves the idea of the interval activities as well. I also do too. And I like the post-it idea, or not the post-it, but the, um, yeah, like posts I'm like, the little card that you write on and then kind of move around so that you can test it in your class. So thanks for that, Merlene. All right, we're gonna move on. So um, I'm gonna share some, my part is really just kind of some examples. So things that I implemented when I was in the AQ course or that I'm still kind of implementing and refining, I should say. Um, and so some examples of active learning that I could share. Um, one of the ideas that we got from that course was just introducing a new topic with um, a discussion. So in my class, I teach a couple of different classes, but I teach a class called Food Literacy, which is a culinary basis course with some concepts of sustainable food systems. And so after the first unit, I'd always have, it's a blended hybrid class. So most of the lectures are recorded online, but we meet face-to-face -face occasionally. And we usually met face-to-face -face for um, an exam review before the first exam. And so in the past, I just made the whole period just exam review, but with this course, I made some adjustments. And so I took a portion of that exam review and added in a little discussion. And since last year was COVID, we were always via Zoom. And so we did it in um, discussion rooms, but I posed three questions about the next unit. Um, which was on meat, poultry, and seafood, and food systems, essentially. And so I um, put the students in breakout groups, had them discuss, you know, what they already know on the topic, what are questions or concerns they have, or they've heard other people, you know, express about, you know, where their meat, poultry, and seafood's coming from, and the whole process, farm to fork, and then also any things that they would want me to specifically address in that second unit, and then we came back together as a full group. Um, and then we're able to discuss those and I was able to jot down things that I could, you know, put in announcements or I could incorporate into my lectures so that I was touching on those. Um, I have been listening to a book by Brown at all, Make It Stick, The Science of Su Successful Learning, sorry. Um, and he kind of talks about this and, and refers to it as priming the mind. And it's where you're, you're asked to kind of struggle with a problem before sh being shown the answer of how to solve it. Um, and he says that, you know, research shows that subsequent solution is better learned and more durably remembered. And so this is kind of, you know, you're not really going through a problem, but you're discussing a topic that hasn't been, you know, you haven't read the literature on yet and you haven't had the, the lecture on it yet. And so it gets them thinking about it, piquing their interest. And then when you cover it in the class period, um, again, there's those greater connections. Another approach I have um, attempted is atomic assessments. And so um, I have incorporated this in a couple different ways into my classes. And this is kind of the effect of creating that pause, like Marlene was saying, you, you lecture for a period of time and then you pause. And so with online learning, um, you know, you have to do it a little bit differently. And so I did it with atomic assessments and I'm gonna stop my screen. I'm just gonna go into my um, class so you can see I really would. All right, so I did it a little bit differently in a couple of my lectures and so, this is in a course, Maternal and Child Nutrition. And so I always start the module page with the objectives and those objectives align directly with my um, study guide questions. So it's direct there. I use um, auto access so they can go directly to the chapter to read it. Um, and so then I have a chunk of lecture and then atomic assessments is a kind of a quiz tool that you can embed right into Canvas where you have questions embedded right on that page. So they don't have to go to a different page to take a quiz. So I made these little questions um, ungraded and they can take them as many times as they want to, but it basically makes them pause from the lecture for a minute and then kind of think about what they've been learning. I am not very good at um, micro lectures. So you'll notice that mine are not in that six to 10 minute or seven to 10 minute mark, some of them are longer, but nonetheless, I have a chunk of lecture and then I have some questions to make them think, chunk of lecture, questions. Um, and again, it, it kind of creates that pause and makes them start thinking more actively. In my uh, food literacy class, I, I don't have micro lectures yet, so I just have the big chunk uh, recorded lectures, but um, you can see again, I include their objectives, 
And this semester, last semester, I just asked them, you know, what did you learn from the lecture? What's unclear? And do you have additional questions? This semester, because I've been listening to this make it stick, that's really making me think about how we learn um, and how important priming the mind is. I'm adding these prime your mind questions. So there's a few questions related to the chapter or the content before they actually listen to it that they can try to respond to again ungraded so they can respond as many times. So it just kind of gets them thinking about the topic. Um, and then they have access to the reading, the PowerPoint lectures. And then I'm going to do this reflection for retention, where again, I, I, I remind them what reflection is because in a lot of the literature, it, it, it reminds us when we're doing these things, and Marlene mentioned this as well, um, it's helpful if students understand why you're doing what you're doing so that it, it gives them that buy-in like, oh, this is going to help me remember it a little bit better. So um, I, again, it's gonna be a free space where they can um, reflect on what they just learned in that lecture. I also mention I give them some reflection questions if they wanna use them. I also tell them they could grab the, the objectives up above and bring them back down and respond to those as kind of, you know, getting a head start on reviewing for the exam, right? So I don't know how many students will respond to this, but nonetheless, um, it's an option for them to kind of reflect and pause and think about what they've been learning. I'm gonna go back to um, the PowerPoint slide here. So I am a big fan of mid-semester evaluations. And I did ask on my mid-semester evaluations last spring if students like the atomic assessments, and this was in my maternal and child nutrition class. And um, on a scale from one to nine, nine being the best, the average score was seven. So pretty good, they liked it. I did go in and look at numbers and really only about 58% of students were doing the atomic assessments because they were optional. Um, but of those 58%, they liked them. So I'm still trying to think of ways to kind of get others engaged, whether it's extra credit or maybe just re requiring it for a point. Um, but there's a lot of um, research, research on these low state quizzes and the benefits of them continually uh, quizzing yourself and making yourself think about what you've been learning. Oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way here. Um, so some other, I'm going to run out of time. So some other, I did a jigsaw assignment and I think you saw that on uh, Marlene's diagram there of another active learning thing. And this is where you kind of hand the, the assignment over to the students. So you assign them different chapters that they can read. And that's what I did in my class. And then they have to become the expert on it. And then when they came to class, then in groups, they presented, um, developed a little presentation, a five minute presentation, and then they presented it to the class as the expert on the content. So you're kind of giving them the ability to teach and then when they are forced to learn it and then teach it um, also helps with retention. Um, another uh, focus that I really worked on and that was really emphasized in the AQ course is building a community with your students. And um, I find this to be really, really important. Um, there is quite a bit of research that kind of talks about this, that um, a lot of students that are making that transition from high school to college is a very challenging time. And it's even more challenging for those that are considered your underprepared students that are coming from less privileged or more marginal backgrounds. And so it's, it's important that we help them feel like they belong and, and that we care about them and we want to see them succeed. And so there's different approaches to this. One, um, I think it's really important in any Canvas course that you have a start here page so that students know how to orient themselves through the course and, and introduce yourself. So I have a little video clip about myself. I also have it in text if they prefer to read it. Um, also on my start here page, I have a spot where they can set goals. Again, another buy into the course, like what do you already know about the course content? What do you want to accomplish by the end of the semester to increase your knowledge in this course content? Um, also, um, to, you know, develop relationships with your students and help them get to know each other. Um, it's important to do like course introduction discussion posts. So give them an opportunity to introduce themselves and you can provide a variety of different options for their submissions. So um, I let mine either do a video or they can uh, post a picture and describe it or they can just do text usually introducing you know, their names, where they're from, their majors, um, things they like to do. Also, since it's a, a, a food class, I talk, I have them explain, you know, cooking backgrounds, things like that. 
Um, uh, last year at the ETE conference, we had, um, I think it was the keynote speaker, Dr. Idalis Villanueva. I'm probably saying her last name wrong. Anyway, she talked a lot about um, inclusivity and diversity and equity and the importance of having the appropriate tone in your syllabus as well. So making sure that you're reaching all students I just put a few examples here. Um, you know, some students can get very overwhelmed or not have the resources they need and they might feel the need to cheat. So instead of saying no cheating allowed, a softer tone can be, you know, if you feel the need to cheat because of difficult circumstances, please reach out to me first. I can give you the resources. I will work with you so you don't have to get to that point where you have to cheat. Um, I also have this life happens policy. Um, I'm a mom of three kids. I know life happens. We can't always control things. And so um, students have lives that are unpredictable as well. And so I let them one time a semester submit a paper late. They just have to contact me within 48 hours. Let me know they're going to do that. And um, they can submit it late, no questions asked, and still get credit for it. Um, another thing with building um, inclusivity is just um, I, I do a mid-semester evaluation. In the past, I would ask, you know, what do you like about the course? What do you, you not like about the course? What do you want me to do more of, less of? And I still ask those questions, but I've also added in these um, specific questions to inclusivity that I got from the AQ course. So, you know, do you feel like the course resources and materials represent a diverse, diverse society? And you can see, um, and then I also ask these questions like, do you feel welcome in the course? Do you feel comfortable reaching out to me? Do you feel your contributions in the class are valued? Do you feel comfortable sharing your opinions? Do you feel like you're fairly graded? I always have my TA, TAs uh, compile the results and then um, I come up with action points for the students and action points for myself. And then I share those with my class. And you can see here with this one, most people felt like I had um, diverse class resources, but some felt like I could do better. And you can see as students, um, comments here. And these are things that I hadn't even thought about incorporating in my class and materials I've been reading. The chapter never discusses these. But again, these are things that would um, diversify the content, diversify the discussion, and be useful to students. And so I appreciate their feedback. And I think they can see that I implement it and appreciate it as well. Um, also, you can do uh, weekly announcements. So these can be done in different formats. Text, video is really nice. It adds a personal touch. I know in the AQ class we took, they showed this really incredible example of this faculty member. He was doing awesome things as he was doing his uh, like class announcements, like going down a huge hill and rollerblades with a GoPro or running a marathon while lecturing. So I thought, I'm going to go out of my like comfort zone, get out of my office, go in my backyard. That's the first step. And the wind's blowing. You can't hear me. Kids are running in the background. Um, it was a little bit crazy. But nonetheless, I, students appreciated it. And one thing that I took from the course that students really do appreciate is identifying students by name in your announcements. So in this pediatric fact sheets one, I just graded it. I was so excited to be done grading. And then I mentioned a few students' papers and what they wrote about and said, you know, I learned a lot from your paper. It was really great. And so if you can point them out by name, again, that brings in that personal connection because you're not face-to-face. -face. You can um, still connect with them in that way. Um, there's a lot of other different ways that we can um, help to, you know, support our students and, and have a supportive learning environment. One is just organization of our courses. That makes a big impact for students. So if we have our modules that look and flow, um, they're easy to find, right? There's a predictable rhythm about them each week. You have about the same things, the same lectures, quiz, discussion. So they know what to plan for. Um, that goes a long way. Um, in our assignments and our discussions, if we can provide a variety of different options and, and also, for example, in the discussions, you could have different uh, questions that probe their discussion points, or you could allow them to submit it differently, whether it's in text or it's in um, video format or just audio format. Um, that can help a lot as well. Um, I'm pretty much out of time, but I, I just wanted to point out that these little things can go a long way. And in my end of semester evaluations, I had students say, and that was just after incorporating one semester after for incorporating some of these AQ principles that I learned um, that she's super encouraging throughout the whole semester was evident that she strove to show students that she cared about our well-being 
as students, but also her academic performance. Uh, she was crystal clear on expectations. She was organized and easy to follow. Um, you could tell she put forth a ton of effort to help us succeed. You could tell she really liked you and wanted you to be in her class. Uh, we want our students to know that they belong here and um, that we want to see them succeed. And doing these little things can really make a difference. So I want you guys to write down just one thing that you will apply or a change in your teaching approaches and also set a deadline because without that deadline, it's probably not going to happen. Um, so if you can do that, uh, here is our resources. There's a variety of different resources to um, many other things that we talked about and our references. And if there's any questions, I will open it back up. 